Right. So um, we are going to get started with our May Psychology Grand Rounds. Um, and today I have the great pleasure of introducing um, Rosam uh, Rosamond Rhodes, who is a um, professor of medical education and the director of bioethics education at the Icon School of Medicine at Sinai. Um, she's also the a professor of philosophy at the CUNY Graduate Center and a professor of bioethics and associate director of the Clarkson Mount Sinai Bioethics Program. Um, Dr. Rhodes teaches courses in several MS and PhD programs. Professor Rhodes writes on a, a broad array of issues in bioethics, and she's published over 250 articles and chapters. Um, she's co-editor, notably, of the Human Microbiome, Ethical, Legal, and Social Concerns, the Blackwell Guide to Medical Ethics, Medicine and Social Justice Essays on the Distribution of Health Care, and uh, Physician-Assisted Suicide, Expanding the, Expanding the Debate, and her new book is The Trusted Doctor, Medical Ethics, and Professionalism. Um, Dr. Rhodes has been a PI and investigator on several research projects, and uh, she also serves as co-chair of the Mount Sinai Hospital Ethics Committee. I'm very excited to hear her talk today, and uh, Dr. Rhodes, the, the forum is all yours. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that beautiful welcome, and let me see if I can share my screen. Slideshow from the beginning. Can everybody see this? Anybody have a problem seeing it? So after- see it. Thank you. You see it, okay. So after almost 35 years working at Mount Sinai as a bioethicist, I have come to learn some things about medical ethics and what I'm going to explain today is what I've learned, which is probably quite different from what you have already heard about medical ethics. So nothing to disclose. And the agenda for today is first, I'm going to explain the common morality approach to medical ethics. This is probably what you have heard about medical ethics. Then I'm going to give you two arguments against that approach. One is the negative argument, what I call the negative argument that says that common morality does not account for medical ethics. And then I'll explain um, some of the fundamental duties of medical ethics and give you, oops, I'm pushing the wrong button here. A positive argument for why medical professions require a distinctive ethics. So here we go. Here it's the common morality approach. It's most famously presented by Beecham and Childress in their many editions of Principles of Biomedical Ethics. There was also earlier on in the late 20th century, beginning of the 21st century, two books by Dan Clauser, Bernie Gert, and Chuck Culver on bioethics, where they give 10 rules. But what's similar about both of these approaches is that they both claim that medical ethics is common morality applied to medicine. So here is a picture of Beecham and Childress, and they're both really nice people. Um, and what they maintain is that they draw upon common features of common morality by identifying the four principles of respect for autonomy, beneficence, non-maleficence, and justice as the, quote, considered judgments that are the most well-established moral beliefs to serve as an anchor of moral reflection. And they go on to say that particular moralities, such as professions, quote, share the norms of common morality with all other justified particular moralities. In other words, common morality is medical ethics. There is no difference. I have to use those bottom things. And there are 
Bernie Gert and Dan Clauser and Chuck Culver, and they two were very nice men. Bernie Gert and Chuck Clauser were close friends. And these quotes come from um, Dan Clauser's Encyclopedia of Bioethics article. And there he writes explicitly, bioethics is not a new set of principles or maneuvers, but the same old ethics being applied to a particular realm of concerns. Many of the duties of a profession are particular applications of the general moral rules, which are valid for all persons in all times and places in the context of the special circumstances, practices, relationships, and whatever else, the process of the professions gets covered up on my screen. <laughs> So all of these, all five of these men have maintained that common morality is the ethics of medicine. Now, that's their claim. Medical ethics is just the ethics of everyday life applied to medicine. And I'm asking the question, is that true? So the common morality view is that, Maybe I can get rid of this. Is that all bioethics is traditional ethics applied to novel circumstances and it makes universal claims. And those universal claims that doctors have the same duties as everyone else. And the character of a doctor is, should be no different than anyone else's. Now my view is, are you crazy? So my view is that the ethics of medicine is an uncommon morality and to prove that, all I would need is a single counterexample. So if someone says, all apples are red, all you have to do to disprove that is bring in one golden delicious apple or one Granny Smith apple, and you've disproved it. All you need is one counterexample to disprove a universal claim. But since this is so commonly believed in medical ethics around the world, I'll try bringing in a week's worth of counterexamples. So I'll offer you seven of them. I'll try to go through this kind of quickly. So the negative argument is an argument by counterexample. And all I need to convince you of is one of them. If you find one of these counter arguments convincing, then I've made my case. So in ordinary life, for example, we can see, imagine a grocer who runs out of oranges. He calls up another grocer nearby and asks for a share of the oranges. And that grocer could say, I'm not sharing my oranges with you. My customers will want them. Find oranges somewhere else. And you're blameless. Or a neighbor could say, I'm going away for a weekend. Will you look after my cat? You can say, no, I'm not going to look after your cat. Um, I don't want a cat look, running around my apartment. Or the neighbor could ask you for your grandmother's honey cake recipe. And you may say, that's a family secret. I don't share it with anybody. So a request in ordinary morality, you're free to deny anybody's request. We have it every day at Mount Sinai. People will say, hold the elevator. And if you're rushing somewhere, you need not hold the elevator. Okay, but when a medical professional receives a request from another medical professional, there's a strong obligation to share your medical resources, your knowledge, your physical assistance to render aid. Because the presumption is you need that assistance to serve the interests of patients. Um, if you've noticed when you call a doctor's office, they go through this long menu of which button to push, but if you're a doctor, push button number one, because the doctor will take that call and respond with whatever you need to know. And if you're a surgeon at Mount Sinai and having difficulty closing a wound, you call and other surgeons must come running to your assistance. Very different from common morality. In ordinary life, this is counterexample too. People are free to make decisions any way they want. Which movie shall I see this weekend? Let's flip a coin. Your choice or my choice. It doesn't matter. You can consult 
tarot cards. You can pick the name you like, whatever you want. When it comes to doctors making decisions for patients, we expect them to rely on scientific evidence when there is such evidence. Something like your gut feeling is not good enough for justifying a medical decision. And in ordinary life, we share information. I can tell you about which restaurants I really enjoyed and which restaurant you shouldn't order the fish in because you're likely to get sick. It happened to me the past two times. Don't let, lend money to that person. You're not likely to see it again. Um, who's going out with whom? Whatever, we share information. It's entertaining, it's useful. But when it comes to medicine and it's information about a patient, what's the rule? It's confidentiality, don't share. So in ordinary life, you share information, except when somebody's made a promise explicitly or implicitly not to, I promise whatever you tell me about your daughter, I'll keep it a secret. Or in business, it's a non-disclosure example. And in medicine, it's the opposite. We don't share information unless there is a danger to a patient or another. In ordinary life, we choose with whom to associate. And I taught my children, I imagine you taught your children, be careful of the friends you choose because people can leave you astray. But in medicine, you're not supposed to be judgmental. You're supposed to take care of everyone who needs your help. In ordinary life, you get into a subway car and somebody looks dangerous. They look like they're threatening people. The next stop, you'll change your subway car. We're very judgmental. And the better you are at it, the better off you are. And in medicine, a patient comes in, even if it's Tony Soprano, and you're worried for your life, he needs psychological care. You have to provide it and do it with care and respect. Now, most people today consider sexual, sexual activity among consenting adults ethically acceptable. But in medicine, if patient says, doctor, let's have a fling, it's not, expect, it's not acceptable. And even if the, it's initiated by the patient, it's not acceptable, let alone if it's initiated by the clinician. In ordinary life, you go to a cocktail party and asking invasive questions is regarded as rude. You probably don't even ask in some communities, who did you vote for for president? Um, how much money do you have? How much land do you have? We don't pose such questions, but a doctor taking a patient's history will ask about, tell me about your bowel habits and your sexual practices and your drug use. You won't ask any of those things at a cocktail party. So things that are permissible become impermissible in medicine. So that's six, we have one more counterexample. And in ordinary life, Father Kant teaches us that you're supposed to cast a veil of philanthropy over the acts of others, which means whatever decisions another person is making, you're supposed to go so far as possible to presume that they're making them for good reasons and leave them alone. But in medicine, if you get a patient who comes in with lots of tattoos, you're going to warn them about the risks of hepatitis. And if they're smoking cigarettes, you're going to warn them about the risks of cancer. And if they're overweight, you'll admonish them about weight control. All of those admonishments are questioning their capacity. And when somebody is using urgent life-saving treatment without giving you a good reason, the strangulated hernia, we decide that they don't have capacity and we do whatever is necessary to, in opposition to their wishes. So instead of presuming capacity and respecting, we're constantly assessing capacity 
and willing to intervene to the extent necessary. So I put these together into a table so you can see that the duties of medicine and common morality are very different. In the first example, doctors have a duty to act for the good of patients and society. In other words, an ideal from common morality is, trans, is a duty in medicine. And this choices issue, or make choices any way you want. In medicine, it's a duty to make choices, make decisions based on scientific evidence. So you see that some actions that are permissible in everyday life become impermissible, and other actions that are impermissible in everyday life can become a duty for medical professionals. So I can't see you right now, but I'm hoping that for each of you, there's at least one example that you find compelling, which means that I've made my case by counterexamples, this negative argument showing that common morality looks radically different from everyday ethics. So common morality could not be the ethics of everyday medicine. So does anybody have any questions they want to ask? Just turn on your microphone and call out if you have any questions at this point. Okay, then I'll continue. So before going on, I have to make a distinction between what I call roles and what strictly gets called professions. So I have these two son-in-laws in Montana. They're both bow hunters. And when they shoot a deer, they go on to butcher it. And there's nothing in common morality that prevents someone from butchering their own meat. If someone hangs up a shingle and says, I'm a butcher, then they, ha they have a business and they get paid for it. And I'm calling that a role rather than a profession. So I have here as example of roles, the butcher, the baker, and the candlestick maker. And in, the point here is that when people assume these roles, even if they get paid, this is their paid, paid activity, I'm not calling it a profession. I'm restricting the term profession to a very narrow subset of activities for which you can be paid. So the baker opens up a shop and bakes a lot of muffins and can sell them, but I'm free to bake with my grandchildren and nothing wrong with it. There are no different rules for the paid baker and for me. And the candlestick maker, they, they have a job and earn their living making candlesticks but my grandchildren at holiday time, they make me candlesticks and that's perfectly all right. It's governed by the very same rules. Then there are these special obligations that people can take on in common morality. So if you don't want to, to be a pet owner, you don't have to be a pet owner, but if you choose to become a pet owner, then you're taking on special roles that not everybody has. So most people on the weekend, people who are not pet owners, they can sleep as late as they want, or on their vacation, they can sleep as late as they want. And if it's a cloudy, rainy day and you don't feel like getting out of bed, you don't have to. But if you take on the responsibility of being a pet owner, then even if you feel like staying in bed and even if it's raining and cold outside and you'd much rather stay indoors, you have to walk the dog. And there are similar responsibilities that we take on in families that are special duties that you get by keeping your association with family members. So those I all count as roles. And what makes a profession different is something else. So this is the positive argument that explains what makes something a profession. And we'll take medicine as our example here. Now, certainly medical professionals 
have a lot of knowledge that a lot of other people have about things like anatomy and physiology and biochemistry and so on. But anybody who buys the textbook and really studies it can have the same knowledge. What makes medicine their, a profession is that medicine has exclusive rights. Now, famous legal scholar and philosopher Hofeld described different kinds of rights, four different kinds of rights. There are liberty rights, like the right to speak, right to choose your religion. And then these other kinds of rights that are powers, privileges, and immunities. And among these powers that medical professionals have are the power to determine that somebody lacks decisional capacity and impose treatment over objection or to restrain patients, um, depriving them of their freedom and either, even the power to declare death. Those powers ordinary people do not have. Only members of the profession have those powers. And then there are privileges that go with that profession, like asking probing questions. Tell me about your bowel habits and sexual preferences. Um, examining nakedness. Take off your clothes and let me examine you. We even use different language. So when a clinician asks a patient to disrobe, what they're doing is then inspecting and examining and palpating. In ordinary language, we would say something like, instead of inspecting, they're ogling the patient, they're ogling a person, or they're caressing or fondling. So different language for what can look like very same activities. So also the privileges of imaging your insides and privileges of prescribing medications and performing surgery and inflicting pain, even by asking people about pain, emotionally painful experiences. And when they do these things, if harm results, as long as somebody isn't being grossly negligent, the clinician is immune from prosecution for employing their powers and privileges. So medical professions require a distinctive ethics because their distinctive powers, privileges, and immunities are not governed by common morality. If nobody in ordinary society is allowed to prescribe, administer poisons, that's what medicines are. They're by definition of the FDA, dangerous things and nobody else is allowed to cut into people and remove a pound of flesh, then common morality does not have rules about how to do those things appropriately. So because common morality doesn't allow those things, they haven't made rules for them. So when you're using those powers, privileges, and immunities, they are, are not and cannot be covered by common morality. So medical ethics, I conclude, is an autonomous field because the duties of medical professionals are not derived from the precepts of common morality or any other field, and they cannot be deduced from the precepts of common morality. And because the profession entails distinctive powers, privileges, and immunities that are not addressed by common morality, no one outside of the profession is allowed to use them. So as an independent domain of medical ethics, of ethics, the special requirements of medical ethics have to be defined and explained and required by the profession. That means they're internal to the profession. So how does this come about? You can imagine a group of people, smart people just like us, and they notice that 
Sometimes people get become ill. Sometimes they become injured. Sometimes they themselves become ill or injured. And if you were in such a condition, you would want interventions that could help alleviate the discomforts or the limitations. So they allow a group to have special powers, privileges, and immunities to develop the ability to understand what to be done and to get it done. So that group is allowed and required to use their powers, privileges, and immunities, but only for the good of patients and society. So we have these medical, this medical knowledge, powers, privileges, and immunities, which are associated with distinctive rights that amount to a warrant to perform actions that are impermissible for others to do, and a monopoly over the field of employment. And you need medical ethics because these things are extremely dangerous in anybody's hands. So you need rules to protect society from the dangers. So this is the story that I'm telling you, that society grants rights to the medical profession and medical professionals and trusts that they will be empowered to use them and employ those powers and privileges in a way that is trustworthy. In other words, society limits those powers and privileges and can take them away. And we have some real life examples in our country right now. So right now, since last summer, we have the Dobbs decision where the Supreme Court took away powers and privileges from doctors in many states to perform abortion. And you can see the different rules in different states. Sometimes abortions prohibited anytime, sometimes after six weeks of gestation, sometimes after 12 weeks, sometimes after 24 weeks, sometimes without limit. It's the society that creates the boundaries. Right now in New York, New York State, Physician aid in dying is not permitted, but in a, a bunch of states, including just across the river in New Jersey, medical professionals can prescribe medication to hasten death. It's legal. So society has these rights and powers and privileges granted by society, and society is, in a sense, looking over your shoulder all the time and can decide to remove them. And if you've been at Mount Sinai for a while, you may have recalled the big scandal about when we had a living donor death in our liver transplant program. And at the time, the state authorities came in and shut down our adult to adult liver transplant program for a year. That is limiting the powers and privileges of our institution and impose the requirement of having a living donor advocate see every potential living donor before the transplant. That's a restriction on the use of the power and that comes from society. So what this picture tells you is these powers, privileges and immunities are dangerous and the only way you get to keep them is by using them in a trustworthy way. Otherwise, society can limit them, take them away. So these powers, privileges, and immunities are granted to the profession and professionals only on the condition that medicine can be trusted to wield them for the good of patients and society. And we get these kinds of thoughts expressed by Dr. Edmund Pellegrino, who spoke in, at Mount Sinai years ago, and he published these thoughts. 
And he talked about profession is to declare aloud publicly. So these, this ethics that medicine has is declared publicly at our white coat ceremony and at graduation, doctors take the oath. And professional societies around the world post the distinctive codes of ethics of the profession on their websites. It's made publicly known that these are the rules that are governing our behavior and we commit ourselves to them. And Pellegrino goes on to say, professionals commit themselves when the oath is taken, it is a binding commitment of entering a moral community whose defining purpose is to respond to and advance the welfare of patients. He goes on to say that the profession is declared in the daily encounter with patients. Every time a physician sees a patient and asks, what can I do for you? She is professing to use competence in the best interest of the patient. The doctor voluntarily promises that he can be trusted and incurs the moral obligation of that promise. <laughs> so becoming a medical professional is making a promise to fulfill the special duties of the profession. And oop, there you have a picture of, for example, nurses making the promise of the profession. And therefore, the first fundamental duty of medical ethics is seek trust and be deserving of it. And the second duty is to use medical knowledge, skills, powers, privileges, and immunities in serving the interests of patients and society. And all this slide says is, Remembering those two fundamental rules is a lot easier than remembering Beecham and Childress's four principles. And it's certainly a lot easier to say, be trustworthy and act in the interest of patients and society than saying non-maleficence. So these are the two foundational duties. This is what you need to remember to understand medical ethics. And then you can develop other duties as being implied by them, given the powers, privileges of the profession, how to do it in the right way. So I've, in my book, enumerated 16 duties. I, we won't go through all of them now. And the big implication is that because medical ethics is uncommon morality, very different from common morality, the duties have to be defined and explained and the commitment to them have to be inculcated into professionals. And that's it. And for those of you who may recognize him, that is a portrait of Arthur Aphsis, our former chair of surgery. So I can stop sharing. And that's all I have for you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rhodes. I, don't, I hope that made some sense. And you, now you can ask questions, tell me why I was wrong, where I went wrong. Oh, that was wonderful. We didn't even, you, uh, you ended early. And so we didn't even have a chance to ask everyone to put questions into the Q&A, but we will do that now. And I'm gonna put it in your chat. Uh, as well. So if you have any questions for Dr. Rhodes, please enter them into the Q&A section and we will read them to her one at a time. If you have, if you would like to ask a question by raising your hand and put your hand up and then after we do the written questions, we will address those. So I'll just put this information in. It would the be great if you could turn on cameras that, so we could see each other. If for those of you who would like to ask questions by raising your hand, if you'd like to turn on your camera during that time, you can do that. Um, so I've just spoken heresy to you, told you that medical ethics is not common morality, even though everybody else believes it. Okay, there's a question. Okay, 
No. Do you have your first question? Again, thank you for an excellent talk, Dr. Rosen. Here's your first question. It comes from Julia. Uh, how does the non-mandated mental health care fit in with the duty of the psychiatric community to provide care? It's you're joining the profession and the commitment is to use your powers, privileges, and immunities to serve the interests of patients. So if somebody needs the help of a psychologist, you have a duty to provide care through the organizations and mechanisms that we have available. Make an appointment to see you. I, I have a sense that you're asking something else that I'm not grasping. Uh, Julia, if you are asking something else and would like to type it in or raise your hand, feel free to do that. Uh, for now, we'll just move on to the next question. Uh, this is from an anonymous attendee. Are psychologists professionals by this definition? Uh, if, you're, if you're teaching in a university, you're not a medical professional. If you're, if you're teaching university, if you're teaching people to become clinical psychologists, or you're working in a clinical setting, seeing patients, you are a medical professional. So it, it's not simply about the knowledge, it's about in a psychologist, the, the psychologist interaction with a patient, when you ask people to share details of their lives and their feelings behind your closed door, you are acting as a medical professional and you have all those duties. So it's, it's if you think about trust, think about you're in an elevator, the Annenberg elevator, and we know they're either all going up or all going down at the same time. So you could have a long wait for an elevator and you're the only one in this elevator and you hear somebody say, hold it, please. And you hold the door and in comes this large person, much larger than you. The idea is you have trusted them not to harm you and take advantage of being in this enclosed space with a stranger for several minutes. Now, if that is the kind of trust that goes on in everyday life, this the trust that people give you by sharing the secrets of their lives, telling you about dreams and feelings and thoughts that they don't feel free to share with anybody else, that's giving you extraordinary powers and you have privileges to say things that nobody else everybody else would think is rude or an imposition or Mount Sinai we could say Skupska and it's part of your duty. So I think psychologists who work in a clinical setting or teach people to become clinicians have the duties of medical professionals, all of them, and they have to consider them strict obligations that they are committed to uphold. Thank you, Dr. Rhodes. Uh, we have Julia here who is going to ask her question aloud. So please go ahead. Hi, thank you for a wonderful presentation. I learned a lot. Uh, but I had, I think my question goes to what we could say a conflict between morality outside of the medical profession and morality within the medical profession as you define it, because we allow people to make a choice about whether they will accept care for mental health or not. And in that way, we're not a medical professional saying you must get mental health care. And as a mental health provider, if I see that the person is suffering from X, Y, and Z, and I feel that the person would benefit from treatment, then we have an obligation to provide the treatment. But if the person is rejecting the treatment based on the non-medical morality, then there's a bind. And I feel that much of what we see in our day-to-day -day lives, especially in New York City, uh, has to do with the conflict between these two moralities. 
between what we must do as providers to help the person with mental health issues and the choice not to accept the help from the mental health professionals. That's very, very well said and very clear. There's a famous story told by a Dr. Self Seltzer. He was a psychiatrist up at Yale. And he tells the story about sitting on a bus on a summer day and seeing a lesion on the neck of the person sitting in front of him. And it looks like a melanoma. From everything he's seen and read, it really looks like a melanoma. And he gets off the bus without saying anything to that man. And as an ordinary person, we might think, isn't it intrusive and rude to say something to somebody on the bus? And to me, it struck me that he was failing in his duty to say something. Now, somebody in the bus, you can't drag him into the doctor's office. But, but I think you have a duty to say, I see something here and it's worth looking into. So there are, you can't drag people in to be treated. And so on the ethics committee, we deal with this every week. Somebody who doesn't want dialysis. You know, without the dialysis, they're going to die very soon. And I think we could offer it, but we cannot take away their liberty, yeah. except when you're quite sure that you're going to provide a very significant benefit. So there has to be very high likely of very significant benefit with treatment and a high likelihood of very significant harm without the treatment. Um, so if somebody came in with a strangulated hernia and said, no, I don't think I'm in the mood for surgery today, and you know they're going to be dead in hours without the surgery, and they're in the hospital already, you have the power to do something. So big difference in inside and outside of the hospital, and that's part of what society allows. If you're, you come in voluntarily, we, we have a lot more powers. So the person who walks in voluntarily, you can put a 72 hour hold on them against their objection. So those borders, which look quite, quite arbitrary are set by society. Of, thank you. Okay, thank you for your question. Thank you for clarifying. It's an important question. I thought you might have been asking a kind of different question. So when laws come out that require you to divulge whether somebody's an undocumented immigrant, that, and you know about this person's being an undocumented immigrant through your professional interaction, where you have a strict duty of confidentiality, and then a duty set by society of doctors have to medical professionals have to inform about an undocumented patient, you have a real conflict of duties. And that's never easy to resolve. Uh, well, Dr. Rhodes, you have a few more questions in the Q&A, so let's go to the next one. This is from an anonymous attendee. Hi, Dr. Rhodes, are there any limits to serving patients that is ethical? I'm not sure what you mean by serving any limits, do you have the freedom to say, I'm not gonna take care of you because, I, because you voted for Donald Trump? I think not. Or can you say, I'm not gonna take care of you because you have Nazi swastikas tattooed all over you and you say horrible things about Jewish people? I think not. No. The AMA Code of Ethics has this principle inserted. It wasn't there before World War II. It appears around 1950 after World War II that says explicitly doctors have a right to choose their patients. 
And I think they got it wrong. So if that's the question, I think a patient comes with you to you with a need, let's say the child molester. They have a need for psychological care. I think you have a duty to provide that care as much as you find their behavior horrific. And if you know about any impending danger to a child, you have a duty to report it, but you have no right to turn them away because you don't like them or because they smell bad or because they're, you find them physically repulsive or any of those reasons. Uh, next question from uh, another anonymous attendee. I'm curious, how do the proponents of common ethics our medical ethics respond to your counter examples? Well, in, that's an interesting question. So when my book came out, there were three journal articles, three journal articles where I was asked to write a summary of my argument, and then they invited critics. So most of the critics misunderstood the distinction between a rule and an exception. So for any rule, there will be exceptions. But for, so they would come up with a circumstance where, for example, the sharing of the oranges or the, the honey cake recipe. Somebody could say, look, I shared with you my mother's recipe for beef cabbage soup. And I shared with you my grandmother's recipe for um, fettuccine al pepe. And you really like them. Now I'm just asking you for the honey cake recipe out of reciprocity, you owe it to me. So that would be an exception to the rule. You don't have to, based on previous experience between the two people. I think for the most part though, there's a big difference between when there's a rule. So I said, gave you the example of surgery. Nobody's but a medical professional is allowed to cut into somebody's body and remove a vital organ or a pound of flesh. But if it's me and Dr. Edmund alone on an island, and she starts choking. And I saw a video of how you alleviate choking by cutting a little hole in the trachea. And I have a sharp, clean knife. It might even be my job to do that, my duty as one person to another. I think I can help you. It's likely you're gonna die without my help. So, but that's an exception. If I today walk into Dr. Edmund's office and take out a knife and cut into her, I go straight to jail. So I think most of the arguments were of that sort, not understanding the difference between the rule and the exception. Um, and then there was one article by Beecham and Childress where they just, it was ad hominem, they called me names. They said that I was dangerous and confused. And those have been the nature. Oh, and then there were a couple of people who, who didn't understand the role that society plays in all of this. And I think society is the grantor of the powers and the privileges, and you have to be alert to the reaction of society all along. A great example of this society, view, the, the role between society and the medical professionals comes out in COVID. So early on during the pandemic, we had the public health officials get on the television and explain, we have to flatten the curve. Now, I'm not scientifically trained. I had no idea what they were talking about, flattening the curve but they explained it, that our resources are limited. And if the hospitals are flooded with patients, 
they won't be able to take care of people and people will die unnecessarily. So we have to slow the spread of the disease by isolating ourselves, wearing masks and practicing social distancing. And almost everybody could understand what the professionals were telling us. So it's, it's that the professionals are making the rules and they have the obligation of explaining it to the society in the ways that the society can accept and trust and go along with the recommendations. So it's, it's very much a profession operating within society with limitations on what they may do, what they want to do. And you have to earn the trust of society in doing those things. Uh, there's a question from one of our co-panelists, Lisa Cohen. Um, I thank Dr. Rhodes for the important talk. There she is now. Do you have any principles or guidelines to balance the need for respecting patient's autonomy versus duty for care? And Lisa, would you like to ask it yourself? Um, sure. I actually have another uh, question came up, which I think overlaps with um, one of the Q&A questions. So in general, I think the list that we saw of the um, specific aspects of ethics, I think everyone would agree with and be very comfortable with. But the dilemmas come up when the two, when there are various contradictions or conflicts between uh, respecting patients' autonomy and duty to care. And another thing that I think also comes up is psychotherapy is really very different from being a surgeon or from being a cardiologist where we engage with long-term intimate relationships with our patients. We may be seeing them weekly, maybe twice a week, and we can see them for years, if not decades. So our emotional response to the patient is a part of our toolkit. And while I think we all have a responsibility to grapple with our countertransference, there may be patients you just can't work with. Um, so you gave the example of someone who is a um, Nazi, who has Nazi tattoos all over them. If your parents are Holocaust survivors, that may not be something you can manage. So I think common practice would be to refer them. Um, but any thoughts of that? And I think there's a comment in the Q&A. And then just to add to that, I have a job. Um, part of my job is to do psychiatric evaluations for, bar um, for bariatric surgery patients. Um, and so I have guidelines that I have to follow. Um, and so I can easily, not so easily, but I mean, that's pretty clear. Like, are they psychiatrically safe to engage in the parameters? But sometimes I just don't think it's a good idea. And I generally, if they pass the, the criteria, I will pass them, even if I don't think it's a good idea and I don't agree with it. Um, but the way I manage that um, conflict between patient autonomy and duty to care is to inform them as best I can of the risks. Um, and if I really think it's a risk, then I won't pass them. But if I feel like they, they meet criteria um, as stipulated by the laws and, and by my role, but like I wouldn't do it. Uh, so for example, someone's only 250 pounds and they're 25 and they wanna get bariatric surgery and they don't have medical conditions. Um, I don't think it's a great idea, but there's nothing that would stop them. Um, and they understand what they're doing. So I just talked to them about the risks. So any thoughts about um, those two areas of- um, so I'll conflict? start with that one because I was in a very similar pos position. So oh. after that liver transplant death, I became mm -hmm. the living donor transplant, living donor advocate for the transplant mm -hmm. program for four years. I saw every living donor candidate. And there were, I don't know, less than half a dozen, but there were a number of people who I thought, so I also set up criteria. I had to create the criteria that there was no threat of force, no coercion involved, and that they understood the risks involved. Um, and there were several candidates. I remember one woman who came in um, who was donating to her mother and something about her answers. So I'm not a psychologist, I'm just the philosopher. Something about her answers suggested that she was saying all the right words, but they were hollow. And I said to her, I understand you want to be a good donor. 
But I, if, but if it were my mother, I wouldn't be donating to her because she's a nasty piece of work. And when I said that, she just started talking about what a nasty piece of work her mother was. So again, I approved her. I thought she understood the risks. Nobody was threatening her and she decided not to. And I could go through the other stories that were similar. It was me recognizing the limits of my role. They were acceptable from my criteria point of view, but I gave them the freedom to, to refuse. So that's one. And then you talked about the long-term intimate emotional response of a psychologist. And having worked with a psychologist and a psychiatrist with my son and then with myself, I understand something of the relationship, at least from the patient side. And one of the duties that I explicate is I, I call it simply a duty of mindfulness, that in your communication, you have a duty to be aware of how you're looking and what words you're using and how you're saying that them that that is quite extraordinary. So it isn't cutting with a scal scalpel, but just the look of approval or disapproval. And I'm not so good at it. I know sometimes when I'm thinking of what to say, my daughter will jump and say, I can see you're disapproving. And it isn't what I mean at all, but that's just the look that crosses my face. But if I were a clinician, I think the responsibility would be greater to, to master the looks and the feelings. And then you talked about acting for the patient's interest and respecting their autonomy. And this comes up every week in ethics consult circumstances where you can recognize, for example, that the patient doesn't have robust autonomy anymore. They are demented and there is an intervention that could prolong their lives, it could be dialysis, it could be a peg tube for feeding. And what the patient keeps saying, even though they don't have robust autonomy, they keep saying, leave me alone and trying to pull out the peg tube. And that's one of the problems I have with the Beecham and Childress approach, as if beneficence is a clear duty and non-maleficence is a clear duty. And occasionally they contrast. As a clinician, you're constantly trying to assess whether someone has autonomy for making this decision and constantly assessing what serves their interests. And it's a very complicated matter. This isn't an unusual dilemma. This is every patient all the time. So I think, and then there's that famous quote that I gave you about Kant saying, cast a veil of philanthropy over the acts of others, that in ordinary life, unless you walk into a room and see somebody standing on a window ledge of a high building and counting one, two, you leave people alone. You don't interfere with them. But in medicine, in every encounter, I think the clinician is assessing, does this patient have autonomy? And what am I, and you're assessing because you're contemplating intervening. Now, whether you call it education, I'm gonna tell them again, and again, or is it something more paternalistic like, come back next week and why don't you bring someone, bring your daughter with you, bring your spouse with you. It's, it's a degree of intervention with liberty. And these are important judgments. So for a clinician, I think your first job is assess decisional capacity. And to the extent that the patient has it, respect it to the extent that they don't have it, be prepared to act for their good. Thank you, Dr. Rhodes. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Cohen, for your question. We are just about at time now. So everyone else who has questions for Dr. Rhodes can e 
maybe email us or we can pass them along to her. I'm on um, Outlook available. Or if you'd like to, to give your email information, Dr. Rhodes, you can do that as well. Um, a reminder for the group here that we are back on for Psychology Grand Rounds in June, on June 2nd. So we'll see you again. And thanks for joining us today. Take care. Thank you.